How's it going, everyone? Today we will be discussing hemodynamics, and that is all of the factors that play a role in blood flow. So in addition to discussing how blood flow is manipulated throughout the body, we'll also be tying in blood pressure, which most of you have a sense of uh, what blood pressure is, but we'll go into all of the factors that basically influence uh, someone's blood pressure and what events would actually lead to changes in blood pressure and blood flow. Blood flow is going to be an amount of blood or volume of blood that is flowing to a tissue or an organ at any given time. And so blood flow will be determined by changes in pressure and changes in resistance. You can see that when we discuss pressure, we are really discussing a what's called a pressure gradient. So if we looked at a vessel and we looked at the start of the vessel and the end of the vessel here is P1 and P2, you're going to notice that the amount of blood that is flowing through that vessel is going to be determined by the difference of the start of that vessel, the pressure that is higher, and the end of the vessel, the pressure that is lower. So the higher pressure that we have in the start here, P1, well then the more blood that will flow through. And so, you know, if you were to have a question that said which one of these vessels will have the most blood flow and then both the starting pressure and the ending uh, pressure were listed, all you would need to do is subtract that ending pressure from the starting pressures in order to figure out which one has the highest delta P. I think it's important to note the role that blood volume has in blood pressure and blood flow. If you have a larger volume of blood, let's say at the start of this blood vessel, well then that larger quantity of blood exerts more pressure against the walls of this blood vessel. And that's where blood pressure comes from, the amount of pressure that blood's exerting. So if we have higher blood volumes and blood flow at the start of this vessel, well then that creates a high pressure. And if there are no changes at the end of the vessel, well then that just increases the flow. And so you can think of this as a sense and at a singular vessel or the, the circulatory system as a whole. If the pressure at the start of our circulation in the heart is high, if we're able to flow out large quantities of blood, well then, you know, that blood is going to go throughout the whole entire circulation. So the higher volume, the higher pressures we have at the beginning of a vessel or the vasculature, well then the more blood is going to flow throughout. The highest blood pressures we're going to see are going to be right in the left ventricle and the aorta. And so that high starting pressure is going to drive blood flow throughout the body. And as we go from the uh, aorta to the arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, veins, systemic pressures is going to get lower and lower and lower. And that's what allows blood to travel through the whole entire body. So the bigger difference in delta P that we have, the larger the flow. Uh, if delta P was zero, then we would have no flow. So the heart is a major, is the major component in blood flow throughout the body because it's helping to generate these high starting pressures. But in addition to pressure, we also have what's called resistance. And resistance is what opposes blood flow. And when we talk about it at the scale of the whole entire body, we call that total peripheral uh, resistance, which is the summation of all of the vasculature uh, resistances. And so what, what basically goes into resistance? What are the things that oppose blood flow? So we can look at this formula right here uh, to equate that, and this is derived from the uh, Poiseuille equation. And so we're going to see that resistance is going to be equal to a few different things. Uh, one is going to be the viscosity of the blood. So the thicker the blood, the higher the resistance and the thicker the blood then, um, you know, that's going to oppose blood flow. Uh, I like to compare it to thinking about if, if you were trying to pump, you know, syrup across, you know, all these different blood vessels, if, if the consistency of the blood is more viscous, that's going to oppose blood flow than, let's say, something that's a little bit more um, along the qualities of water. And so the, um, you know, the, the hematocrit, the percentage of the blood that is um, red blood cells versus plasma, 
um, really has a role in, in resistance and blood flow. Blood vessel length is also going to influence resistance and blood flow. And if we think about it, if we have a set amount of blood and we increase the amount of surface area that that blood has to travel towards, or you know, we increase the length of that um, vessel, that's gonna be a lot of resistance to, for blood to flow. And the opposite of that, if we're able to um, decrease cross-sectional area of blood vessels and decrease uh, blood vessel length, well then that's less resistance to blood flow and it's able, um, it's easier for blood to travel when there is a shorter length within the vessel. Probably the most important one and the one that the one that is severely going to influence resistance, blood pressure, blood flow, minute to minute, day to day, um, is going to be this lowercase r to the fourth, and that is going to be, be blood vessel radius. And so when we think about resistance and blood pressure and blood flow, you know, the length of your vessels isn't going to really change too much day to day, right? If you put on more mass or, you know, you're going through puberty or something like that, yeah, you're getting more cells, things like that. But just day to day, um, you know, you're not going to see these changes in blood vessel uh, length. Blood viscosity can change with your hydration state. Uh, but when the body really wants to adjust resistance, blood pressure, blood flow, it manipulates the radius because we are going to get more um, out of changing that blood vessel radius as far as resistance is concerned uh, than these two because this is to the fourth power. So in other words, if we had a vessel and then we doubled the size of that vessel, well, what's that going to do? Well, since this is to the fourth power, two times two times two times two, that's going to mean a resistance that is, since it's the denominator here, one sixteenth the resistance. And when we look at blood flow, if we have one sixteenth of the resistance and the same amount of pressure, then our blood flow is going to be 16 fold. And so what I just described right there is called vasodilation. And so if we doubled the size of one vessel, the blood flow is going to increase 16 fold throughout that vessel. Um, and so that's called vasodilation, but we also have what's called vasoconstriction, which is just exactly the opposite. The starting radius of a blood vessel gets cut in half. Uh, then we have the opposite. And so resistance would then increase 16 fold, and that would mean 1 16th of the blood flow is traveling through that vessel. So when we want to have changes in resistance, changes in blood flow, uh, changes in blood pressure, this is a mechanism our body uses in order to do that. And this is really what's going to change blood pressure and blood flow uh, minute by minute, depending on what we're doing. Blood normally flows through our vessels as a laminar flow. You can see that it's all traveling, traveling in a sort of parallel direction, not getting um, you know, bumped up and mixed up and hitting against these walls of the vessel here, just traveling smoothly throughout the blood uh, vessels. But if you increased the velocity of blood flow dramatically, um, or you also or you also influence the viscosity of the blood. Um, if you had a uh, less viscous blood, what you're likely to see is this more turbulent flow, right? We're, we're getting um, a little bit more collision of these molecules here going throughout that blood vessel. And so um, one thing is that this can signal or this can lead to signaling within the uh, circulation and, and what often happens is that when you get uh, these changes in flow and you get a little bit more turbulent flow that oftentimes will lead to molecules that release that uh, signal that we need to dilate uh, this vessel and so that oftentimes is when you know your your blood flow starts to increase these signals these changes in flow are ultimately going to lead to changes in the vasculature it would probably be safe to assume that all of you have had your blood pressure screened in the past and what is blood pressure what are people doing when we inflate the cuff around the arm and then listening uh, for these sounds well what blood pressure is is the pressure that the blood is exerting on the walls of the arteries and that's the one 
um, that we're listening for when we put the cuff on, we're listening for arterial blood pressure. All vessels have blood pressure, but as far as health and function is concerned, we are concerned with the arterial pressure because again, that's the starting pressure. That's the generating pressure, which is going to determine blood flow throughout the whole entire circulation. And so when we are you know, putting that cuff on, inflating it, listening out for those sounds, that first sound we're gonna hear is systolic blood pressure, which is the blood pressure in the arteries when the heart is contracting. So it's, it's taking into account the amount of pressure that the heart is generating. Um, and then when you keep on listening and you hear what's called those cough, cough sounds, so you know the opening of the vessel, you'll hear that first one, your systolic. And then as you go down, the last sound you're gonna hear, that's called your diastolic blood pressure. And this is going to be the blood pressure without the heart. So the blood itself um, will generate a certain pressure, the resistance of the vessels, um, you know, depending on the things we just said, the, the blood vessel radius, blood vessel length, the, the viscosity of the blood, that's all going to generate pressure. But when we listen for blood pressure, that's what we're looking out for. Th those are the two differences between these numbers. Systolic is going to be blood pressure in the arteries with the contraction of the heart and diastolic is going to be the pressure without the contraction of the heart. In this diagram, we could see the pressures throughout all of the blood vessels within the body. In the start in our left ventricle in our aorta, we're gonna have the highest pressures again. So once, you know, once the heart contracts, you see above in the aorta, that's our systolic pressure. And then when the heart is relaxed, that's our diastolic pressure. And we typically take the average, which is called the mean arterial pressure. Uh, but just highlighting here that again, the arterial side will see higher pressures and it, those pressures will drop in order, you know, for blood to flow. And so uh, those high pressures in the beginning will drive the blood flow throughout the whole entire body and make sure that blood uh, travels from that left ventricle down through all the blood vessels, arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, veins, and then makes its way back to the right atria into the vena cava where those pressures are the lowest. They're near zero. Um, and so that high starting pressure and the low pressure in the right side, the right atrium and the vena cava, that ensures that blood flows throughout the whole entire circulation. Our bodies, again, monitor a lot of different things. And so as far as our cardiovascular system is concerned, it is its primary regulated variable, meaning that the variable it cares about when it comes to blood flow um, is what's called mean arterial pressure. And that's going to be the average pressure in all of the arteries. And the reason why the body's so concerned about this pressure and making sure that it's at a normal level is because, again, the pressures at the start of the cardiovascular system are what drive blood flow throughout the whole entire system. So the, so the brain and, and the body is constantly keeping in mind um, this mean arterial pressure in order to have a sense of the state of blood flow and the state of the flow of oxygen uh, throughout the whole entire body. As you're going to see, pressure, flow, and resistance are all related to one another through these equations, right? And so when we calculate mean arterial pressure, the average pressure in all of the arterial circulation, we have a couple of formulas in order for you to uh, know how to calculate that, to know what that is or what uh, influences pressure. So a non-numerical formula here for for mean arterial pressure is cardiac output times total peripheral resistance. So as cardiac output increases, so does pressure. Why? Because cardiac output is another way of saying blood flow. How much blood is flowing into the arteries from the heart? And so of course, the more blood that flows from the heart into the arteries, arteries the higher pressure that's gonna create within those arteries. So the more we increase our cardiac output, the more we increase our heart rate and stroke volume, the more we increase our mean arterial pressure. In addition, increases in total peripheral resistance are also going to increase mean arterial pressure.
So remember back to the things that make up resistance. So if, if blood viscosity increases, well, that's going to increase blood pressure, right? If vessel radius decreases, vasoconstriction occurs, that increases resistance, which also increases pressure. If vasodilation occurs, that decreases resistance. So that would decrease pressure. And so it's important to sort of note this and know what effects that changing one cardiovascular variable is going to have on blood flow and blood pressure. And so again, with those vessels, knowing how the change in vessel radius affects resistance and therefore affects pressure, because this is gonna be the way when we need to change blood pressure, we have changes in blood pressure, that the body's going to be able to accomplish that. So if we need to raise blood pressure, it can do that through the uh, heart mechanisms, the cardiac mechanisms, or vascular mechanisms. There is also a formula for you to actually be able to calculate mean arterial pressure. So I recommend you uh, memorize this one as well in order to be able to calculate it. Um, so in order to find mean arterial pressure, you're going to take diastolic pressure. Remember that bottom number. Let's, for the sake of this answer, use 120 over 80. So this would be 80. And then you're going to add what's called pulse pressure uh, times one third of that value. So uh, pulse pressure is going to be systolic pressure minus diastolic pressure. So in our case, 120 minus 80 is going to be 40, right? And then that 40 for pulse pressure, we multiply times one third, and that's gonna be basically 13.3 repeating, right? 13.33, let's just use that. And then we'll add that again to our diastolic pressure. So if we wanna know the uh, average mean arterial pressure, it's gonna be 93.3 repeating. Blood vessels are able to take on quantities of blood and have a elastic component which allows them to stretch out and hold on to that blood. Um, when the vessel is more compliant, it's able to take on larger quantities of blood volume and have a lower transmural pressure, which is the difference between the pressures on the inside of the vessel versus the outside of the vessel. So we talked about in the last lecture how veins are more compliant. And what that basically means is that they're able to hold on to large quantities of blood without diff much differences in the pressures between the inside and outside of the vessel. And therefore, they are compliant. They could hold on to large quantities of blood. And that's why two thirds of our blood is reserved at rest within our venous circulation. When we talk about how fast blood is going to travel throughout the circulation, that is not only going to depend on blood flow, which again is re the pressure gradient and the resistances, but it also depends on cross-sectional area. And like I told you guys earlier, with resistance, the more vessels that you have, the more total cross-sectional area that you're going to have, means that blood flow is going to slow down um, overall. And so this isn't necessarily like a good or bad thing, and we'll sort of explain why. Um, when we talk about velocity of blood flow, it's gonna be highest in the aorta right when we come out of the left ventricle because the aorta is like, you know, not that big. It's like around four inches big and it's receiving all of the blood flow that the left ventricle that the heart's ejecting. So that velocity is going to be very quick. And then as we increase the cross-sectional area of these vessels, and you're really going to see um, that difference once we get into the capillaries, that is going to slow down blood velocity. So the, um, over the, the most abundant blood vessels in our body are capillaries. If you think about it, we have so many different cells that, that blood needs to be delivered to. And so you need to have all these small capillaries in order to um, have blood be able to transfer materials with those cells. And so since we have a large volume or a large cross-sectional area of those capillaries, blood flow at the capillaries, blood velocity, is going to be very, very low. But if you think about it, that's sort of a good thing, right? Because in the capillaries are where all these exchanges happen. And so you wouldn't want blood to be traveling down really fast 
because you want you know these materials these nutrients these wastes these wastes these blood gases all to be exchanged so you know just just here overall just summing it up velocity of blood flow how quickly blood's going to be flow is going to be um you know dependent on the total cross-sectional area and you know Inversely, if, if cross-sectional area increases, then blood velocity decreases. Remember, stroke volume and cardiac output is impacted by how much blood is returned back to the heart. And this is called venous return. And so we're able to get more blood back to the heart by influencing a few different things. Um, obviously, the venous pressure gradient. And we talked about pumps, how the skeletal muscle pump and the respiratory pump can influence venous pressures. The skeletal muscle pump can help drive up pressure within those veins to help, um, you know, transport venous blood back to the right atrium. And the respiratory pump can change and lower the pressures with inside the thoracic cavity in order to drive um, blood flow back to the right atrium as well. But also we, the body can manipulate the size of the veins. And so when I said vasoconstriction earlier and vasodilation, that refers just to all vessels. But in this particular case, if we are able to constrict the veins, what's that going to do? It's gonna drive up pressure, the P1 in those veins, and then that's going to help deliver more blood flow to this right atria. So the different pumps that we have in our bodies and the size um, of our veins are going to determine venous return. An increase in venous return is going to increase preload or end diastolic volume. That's going to increase stroke volume. That will increase cardiac output and that will increase mean arterial pressure. The amount of blood that an organ receive is going to be based directly upon its metabolic demand. So harder working cells and harder working tissues are going to require more blood. They need more nutrients, they need more oxygen. And so at rest, when you look at the different organs of the body, you see that the digestive organs are you know, highly active at rest. As you're sitting here, those are gonna be the organs that are working the hardest. So you see a majority of the blood is gonna to flow to those digestive organs. But let's say we started to go on a run. Well, now the metabolic demand is going to start to increase in our skeletal muscles. And so blood will be redistributed to deliver more blood flow to that area of the body and then to cut off blood flow to those digestive organs. And so what's going to do that? What sort of mechanism is going to deliver more blood to one area of the body over another? And that's going to be the size of our blood vessels. Remember, we could change the radius, the size, the diameter of those blood vessels in order to manipulate blood flow. And in particular, the, the radius of the arterioles are going to determine how much blood an area of the body is going to receive. So again, at rest, you're going to see, you know, these dilated arterioles heading towards these digestive organs like the stomach. Um, but, you know, if areas of the body that don't need as much blood flow, we can vasoconstrict. But again, the demand, the how much work one organ is doing over the other will ultimately impact that blood flow. So once we start to exercise, what you would see is these arterioles heading to the skeletal muscles are going to dilate while those uh, heading to the stomach in this case would be constricted. So we're going to change blood vessel diameter and blood vessel radius in order to manipulate the amount of blood that's flowing across the body. And all vessels are gonna have some sort of tone at rest, some sort of state of contraction going on, but that can be manipulated based on signals. And what are those signals? What are the things that help determine the vascular tone at rest or at exercise? Well, we're gonna have these intrinsic factors and then we're going to have the extrinsic factors. And we're gonna see that our brain and our nervous system is going to heavily influence the size of the vessels and the direction of blood flow throughout the body. There are physical changes that can determine the size of your blood vessels. So one, for example, would be temperature. When temperature goes up, your blood vessels will dilate. And an easy example to think about is when you are outside on a summer day, let's say you were active, let's say you were exercising or playing sports or something. Well, obviously, as your core temperature goes up on that hot day, you sweat. And the reason you do sweat is because those blood vessels leading to your skin 
are dilating, delivering, delivering more blood flow. And then some of that blood, that blood plasma is going to be basically emitted out of sweat. And so that's how you lower your temperature. And then when it gets cold, the opposite happens. These blood vessels of your skin will constrict and that keeps more warm blood on the inside and that helps heat you up. But in addition to temperature, we also have the amount of blood that's within a vessel is ultimately going to determine its size. And remember, a lot of mechanisms in our body are negative feedback loops. So, you know, the, the vessels have to balance with the amount of blood in order to keep pressure relatively the same at rest. And so if there's an increase of the amount of blood within a vessel, that will increase the stretch uh, within, within that vessel. And then that's going to lead to a signaling pathway, which leads to the contraction of a smooth muscle. So even though we're able to bring in a larger amount of blood into that vessel, well, we're going to react in order to keep pressure the same by, um, you know, leading to a signal that basically constricts the vessel. And then that helps to uh, balance out uh, these changes at rest. In addition to just physical changes, there are different signaling molecules which can change the size of these blood vessels. Uh, once if you have these metabolic uh, products, these metabolic byproducts. So as we go through glycolysis and electron transport chain, Krebs cycle, you know, we see higher concentrations of carbon dioxide, of potassium, of hydrogen. And that signals to these cells that there is an increase in metabolic activity going on here. And so if the metabolism's increasing, remember blood flow is also going to increase as well. And that's why you see um, an increase in that vessel size. You know, also if, you know, the O2 in that local area is dropping, that means that, that those cells, those tissues, again, they're more metabolically active. They're using more oxygen. So they are going to need more oxygen. And that's why the vessel dilates in order to supply more blood flow, to supply more oxygen. Remember I said earlier that mean arterial pressure is the primary regulated variable of our cardiovascular system. And that means that the nervous system can, will influence every other single variable in our body in order to try to maintain the mean arterial pressure. So it's, it's concern and it's registering and it's sensing this pressure in order to make signals and make changes either within our cardiac muscle tissue or to make changes within our vessels. So if we want blood pressure to go up, we would want to increase cardiac output and total peripheral resistance. And we could do that by increasing heart rate and stroke volume or by decreasing blood vessel radius uh, or by increasing blood viscosity or blood vessel length. But what ultimately will change heart rate, will change stroke volume, blood vessel radius, and therefore mean arterial pressure. And we're gonna see that it's the autonomic nervous system that can manipulate these things in order to impact mean arterial pressure. Our brain is going to receive signals from different sorts of receptors. So from proprioceptors, from baroreceptors, and from chemoreceptors. And so, you know, proprioceptors, why would joint movement influence um, our blood pressure and our blood flow and, and how big our vessels are going to be? Well, think about it. If your joints are moving more, that means your muscles are moving more. And if your muscles are moving more, that means they're more metabolically active. And therefore, those vessels leading to those areas of the body that are moving should probably be dilated. And so the brain's picking up on that. It's picking up on the blood pressure from the different baroreceptors within our body. So it's monitoring blood pressure if, if you know, changes need to be made to the heart or to the vessels. And then also chemoreceptors are sending in information. So they're picking up the levels of CO2, of O2 and hydrogen. And you know, if our uh, pH starts to decrease, meaning the blood's more acidic or CO2 starts to build up, that means that we are more metabolically active and that we need to get more oxygen into the system. Um, it does the same thing with blood oxygen levels. If blood oxygen starts to drop, well then, you know, we need to start to pump out more blood and we need to start to deliver more O2 
to these metabolically active tissues. So all that information is coming into the brain. All the sensory information is being processed in the brain stem, in the cardiovascular center, and then we're going to have a certain response based on what's going on. And either we could increase parasympathetic signaling, which would decrease heart rate. So this is going to be when pressure is too high and we need to lower it. That's our mechanism, increase parasympathetic nervous activity to the heart. Or we can increase sympathetic nervous activity. And sympathetic nervous activity is going to occur when we have low blood pressures and we want to raise the blood pressure. And sympathetic nervous activity acts upon our blood pressure in three different ways. An increase in sympathetic nervous activity increases heart rate, it increases the contractility of the ventricles, and it increases vasoconstriction. Here we could see the regulation of mean arterial pressure by our autonomic nervous system. Notice that sympathetic nerves can synapse at the SA and AV node, which influence heart rate. They synapse at the myocardium, which increases stroke volume because of the increased contractility. And they synapse at different, um, you know, smooth muscles within blood vessels in order to vasoconstrict and then raise TPR, mean arterial pressure. You see here that parasympathetic nerves really only synapse at the SA and AV node and only really impact uh, heart rate. There are a few parasympathetic nerves um, that do synapse with some blood vessels th throughout the body, but there are definitely more uh, higher concentration of sympathetic nerves that will influence the smooth muscle tone. And so what does that mean? That means when we want blood pressure to decrease, we are mainly decreasing heart rate. But even though that the parasympathetic nerves may not synapse at the um, myocardium or may not synapse at all these blood vessels, remember the autonomic nervous system is like a seesaw. So once we increase that parasympathetic nervous activity, we're also decreasing sympathetic nervous activity. So these nerves, these sympathetic nerves, you're gonna see a decrease in their activity and thus that would slow down heart rate. It would lower contractility and that would vasodilate the size of these smooth muscles because these nerves, again, are not as active. I want you to remember the cellular events that are going on here in order to influence mean arterial pressure. Parasympathetic neurons release acetylcholine, which bind to uh, cholinergic receptors, and that is going to lead to less action potentials generated by that SA node and therefore a lower heart rate while sympathetic neurons are going to release norepinephrine. And when that norepinephrine binds to receptors on the heart, well, when it binds to beta-1 receptors at the SA and AV node, that increases heart rate. So when that uh, norepinephrine released here binds to receptors on the cardiac muscle fibers, more calcium is released, and then the stroke volume is able to go up due to that increase in contractility. And when norepinephrine binds to alpha receptors located on our arterioles, those smooth muscles that surround those arterioles are going to contract. And that contraction leads to vasoconstriction, and that increase in vasoconstriction raises TPR, and thus mean arterial pressure. The baroreflex is the mechanism of how the baroreceptors within our aorta and our carotid arteries are able to directly influence blood pressure by signaling a feedback loop via the autonomic nervous system. And so blood pressure is what baroreceptors monitor. And so since we're concerned about mean arterial pressure, this directly tells us what the pressure of the arterial blood is in the aorta, and then, you know, another important artery, the carotid artery heading up to our brain. And so, you know, it's important to monitor and measure what that blood pressure is. So we know, you know, what is our starting driving pressure out to the rest of the body. And so let's say there is a decrease in blood pressure in the aorta, in the carotid artery. Well, that's going to signal to these receptors, less pressure is going to mean less signals that are fired by these receptors. 
the cardiovascular center picks up on this and says, wait a minute, we were getting, let's say, 10 action potential potentials a minute. Now it's only seven. And so that tells this area of the brain there's a disruption, there's a lowering of this blood pressure. And so when blood pressure lowers, since this is going to be a negative feedback loop, that's going to increase sympathetic nervous activity and decrease parasympathetic nervous activity. What that does is going to increase heart rate, contractility, so we're increasing cardiac output, and then we are also going to see with an increase in sympathetic nervous activity, we get an increase in vasoconstriction. So both of those things, the increase in cardiac output and the increase of TPR, that increases blood pressure. Just know that the bare reflex can respond to both increases and decreases in mean arterial pressure. If pressure is low, well then it's going to increase sympathetic nervous activity to bring it up. And if uh, mean arterial pressure is too high, then it will increase parasympathetic nervous activity to bring it down. The chemoreceptors within our aorta and our carotid artery will deliver the amount of blood gases like CO2 and O2 within our blood. It's also going to deliver information about pH. And so, you know, this gives the brain a sense of the metabolic environment within our bodies. And if levels of CO2 are higher, then that means more metabolic output. Um, and, you know, this also helps deliver messages to the brain to regulate breathing. And so, again, if our metabolic activity is higher, we're going to need more oxygen. And so not only does, you know, increase in metabolic demand uh, increase uh, cardiac output and d delivery of blood flow, but it's also going to increase our breathing depth and our breathing rate in order to get in more oxygen into the system in order to keep up with that demand. There are many hormones released from different organs of our body that can influence mean arterial pressure. We made mention of one in one of the previous videos, the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, but I really want to talk more about this mechanism once we begin to discuss the kidneys. Uh, but we're going to see that when we do when we do discuss the kidneys, they're going to have a huge role in regulating our resting blood pressure. And one of the mechanisms that is used to manipulate blood pressure is this renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, uh, which which when blood volumes are low. This is going to increase the amount of renin, angiotensin, and aldosterone uh, that's produced, and that's going to increase blood volume, which directly increases blood pressure. In addition, we have epinephrine and norepinephrine. Again, these are sympathetic hormones. So what they're going to do is increase sympathetic ner nervous activity. They're going to increase heart rate. They're going to increase stroke volume. When epinephrine and norepinephrine bind to alpha receptors on blood vessels, they are going to vasoconstrict. And so again, the release of epinephrine, norepinephrine, the increase in sympathetic nervous activity, it increases total peripheral resistance, cardiac output, and mean arterial pressure. Antidiuretic hormone, similar to the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, will lead to increases in blood volume and blood pressure. If you look at the name, it does this by decreasing the amount of water that we are going to excrete from the urinary system. And so we hold on to more water. That means that we have more blood plasma, more blood volume, and that therefore increases our blood pressure. Atrial natriuretic peptide is going to have the opposite effect. And so when, once blood pressure gets too high and this hormone's released by the atrium, it binds to receptors on the kidneys, which lead to uh, more excretion of, of urine and therefore will reduce blood volume and therefore blood pressure. That concludes this lecture on blood pressure, blood flow, and just hemodynamics overall. I do just want to go back to this slide here because it encompasses a lot of what we talked about. And again, the body's concerned about its mean arterial pressure, that starting pressure that helps drive blood flow. And that's gonna be influenced by this cardiac output and total peripheral resistance. And it's important just to go back in your book, to go back through this video and realize how each and every single one of these variables ultimately will impact cardiac output and total peripheral resistance. 
and then how it will impact mean arterial pressure. And to also recognize what our nervous system and what the hormones and neurotransmitters do throughout our body in order to influence mean arterial pressure. And so a lot of times here you're seeing uh, activity from the uh, autonomic nervous system that can influence heart rate, that can influence stroke volume. Um, and influence blood vessel radius. And those are the main three ways that we're going to influence mean arterial pressure. So know how changes in blood volume or changes in the amount of venous return or the changes in contractility, how all of these things, when they're adjusted, how are they all going to ultimately influence mean arterial pressure? Thank you guys so much and I'll see you next video.